inflation has been high for the last 12 or 18 months, but I think a lot of investors have questions right now. Is, is inflation going to stay high? And, and if so, what are the strategies and what are the asset classes that will outperform in this environment that we're in? Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists real quick, um, and then we can dive into the content. But I'm going to start with Jason Cross, uh, Managing Director, Capital Markets, and Head of Investor Relations at Red Brick LMD. Red Brick LMD is a vertically integrated real estate uh, management and development company with a primary concentration in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and Jason leads Red Brick LMD's Investor Relations Group. And Jason, I know that you're a former licensed securities professional. Uh, you have a lot of experience working with high net worth investors and family offices. So we're very happy to have you with us today. Well, thanks so much, Andy uh, and Jimmy and the whole team. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be aboard today and uh, I'm thrilled to be here with uh, our panelists and, and get into a, a stimulating conversation around uh, investing during this and these inflationary times. So thanks so much. Absolutely. And by, by the way, everyone, excuse me if I sound a little bit like a frog. I think I have the same uh, cold that Kelly referenced that she has. Um, hopefully Zoom can't sp spread any germs. Uh, next, we have Kara O'Halloran, Director of Investment Research at FS Investments. So FS Investments, in case you're not aware, they're a leading asset manager providing access to alternative sources of income and growth with over 35 billion, that's billion with a B in AUM. FS Investments manages a growing suite of funds that are designed for advisors, individuals, and institutions to achieve a variety of financial goals. So Kara is a friend of AltsDB. She recently appeared on our podcast where we discussed her take on real asset strategies uh, and I have to say that was a great episode, Kara. So you're always more than welcome here. Well, thank you, Andy. I'm excited excited to be back. Um, I enjoyed our conversation a few weeks ago, and inflation certainly remains a uh, very timely topic. So excited to dig into all of that. Absolutely. Um, last but not least, we have Colin Roche, founder and CIO at Discipline Funds and author of Pragmatic Capitalism at pragcap.com. Maybe our producer can link to Colin's site in the chat. Um, that honestly is one of my favorite investing reads. It has been for about a decade and Colin did not pay me to say that. Um, but I want to mention that discipline funds features the discipline fund ETF. So that's a low fee tax efficient, globally diversified fund of funds designed to help you behave better and stay the course. Really interesting research behind that fund and investment thesis. That ticker is DSCF. So I encourage everyone to check out that fund. Colin, welcome. Andy, thanks. The check's in the mail for the the, the pitch there. So um, yeah, but I'm excited to be here. It's uh, it's always riveting talking about inflation, right? It is for us. I mean, for, for us four here, it is. And, and I think everyone who's joining us today. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists for, for joining the panel. And before we dive into the content, just a few quick announcements. Um, if any of our attendees have any questions for me or for our panelists, uh, please do use that Q&A um, function in your Zoom toolbar, typically at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll make sure to leave some time for Q&A towards uh, the, the end of the panel today. So the first question, uh, I'm going to begin with you, Kara, um, and then we'll get to the other panelists. Um, where is inflation right now? Does, does the CPI accurately reflect what inflation truly is? And based on leading indicators, what kind of inflation rates do you think we'll see going into 2023? Yeah, so I think if we look at what the actual CPI number is right now, 7.7% headline last month, we're expecting 7.3% next month. But let's talk about whether that actually reflects, I think that the question we really want to answer is whether that actually reflects true inflation. Um, and I think the first place that we often go and we're thinking about um, whether that CPI number can truly capture, you know, it's, it's really hard to sum up our economy and inflation in just one data point. And I think this kind of goes to show that. So I think rent and kind of the cost of shelter, so owner's equivalent rent, is really the first place that we might look to say, hey, is this CPI number truly representing the inflation that we're all feeling? So rent really lagged CPI on the way up. So we had these real-time data measures, so things like apartmentlist.com, that's showing rent really, really accelerating on the, before we saw it reflected in CPI. And we're starting to see it just because of the way that it is calculated in CPI, we're starting to see rent moderation um, 
that is not necessarily reflected in the CPI. So the real time, you know, real time data showing us that rent is moderating, but the way that CPI accounts for it, maybe it's not fully reflected. I think it's important to to differentiate between a moderation and a de and a decline, right? We're not seeing, I don't think anyone's going to walk into their landlord's office next week and they're going to hear, oh yeah, your rent's going to be $600 cheaper next year. Yeah, wishful thinking, right? So, but I think it's important also when it, when we think about policy, because that's, that's really what, what all of this boils down to. The Fed is aware of this. The Fed knows about this difficulty in, in calculation. We have these kind of problem children when it comes to trying to measure inflation rent being one of them, healthcare is another tough one. It's very easy to measure goods inflation. It's much more difficult to measure services inflation. So the Fed is aware of this. Powell cited the apartment list data in his most recent speech. So he's aware that we're seeing some of these more real-time indicators showing that rent is moderating a little bit. That said, I think we might be a little, if we think about 2023, we might be a little out of consensus here with what we're, what we're forecasting for CPI. So we think inflation is going to remain pretty stubbornly high. So I think we're, we're calling for roughly 5.5% in the first quarter of next year, probably moderating to about 3.5% by year end. Really, that is coming now from wages. We're starting wages have risen five or six percent year on year, depending on your preferred indicator. Um, so starting to see you know that wage price or that wage pressure, very sticky area. Um, so unfortunately, three and a half percent still uncomfortably above the Fed's target of two percent. Um, and still, you know, a, a heightened inflation environment that we're gonna have to continue to to invest through for um for the foreseeable future. Kara, I think the Fed will be uh, leaping for joy if they hit three and a half by the end of next year, but but maybe they will. Colin, what do you yeah. think? Where Where is inflation right now? Where is it headed in Q1 and Q2? Yeah, it's an interesting time. Kara's comments are great. I, I agree largely with her, her broader thesis that disinflation, the falling rate of, of positive inflation is going to continue to be, I think, the dominant trend in 2023. And that's going to be in large part contributed by the factors that Kara talked about with rents moderating and then goods and uh, services starting to moderate as well. I think that the uh, the commodity markets are clearly reflecting right now that there's a, a a broader disinflationary trend, and I think that this is the this is the point in the market cycle that gets kind of interesting because last year was I think a story all about really inflation risk and interest rate risk, and we're now transitioning into more of a, a portion of the market cycle where I think the credit risk becomes potentially a bigger issue. And you get into this situation where, where the, the Fed has moved so far so fast that now you're getting into the point of the cycle where credit markets now have to start revolving all of this debt at higher rates. And that, to a large degree, creates this sort of unknown risk of actually, is there more downside risk to the inflation story going forward? Does this turn into more of a credit type of event going into 2023 and 2024, especially as housing remains relatively stagnant with the, uh, you know, the surge in mortgage rates? And so I agree with Kara. I think that, um, you know, the Fed likes to look at core PCE. I see core PCE falling to 3% by the end of 2023. So I think the next year is going to be a, a pretty persistent story about disinflation and, a, you know, a falling rate of positive inflation. But still, it's going to be uncomfortably high for the Fed, which in a weird way, I think is sort of worrisome in its own way, because it means that the Fed is likely to remain tight for all of 2023, essentially. So I don't think that the Fed is going to make this big so-called pivot until probably at best late 2023 or 2024. I think they could start to moderate the language. They're certainly going to start to pare back the, uh, you know, the size of the, the rate increases, or they're going to perhaps halt rate increases at some point in 2023 when they're comfortable um, with where inflation is at. But I think there's a, a rising risk here that the Fed is going to stay tight for longer than they probably should. And it creates sort of the opposite effect of what we saw in 2021, where the Fed stayed really loose for longer than they should have, even though a lot of the data was starting to confirm that inflation was problematic. And certainly financial markets were already reflecting that sort of a lot of the craziness that we saw in 2020 and 2021. And I think that there's a rising risk that 
the opposite is happening now. And so even though so I Colin, see- and that's actually what I wanted to ask about next. And, and Jason, I want to let you chime in in a second. But Colin, because you and I discussed this recently in a podcast episode, you think that the Fed might overcorrect and we might actually get deflation or, or they might essentially tank the economy even harder than they mean to? Yeah, I don't know if you'll get outright deflation. I mean, the, that would be more akin to a, a true sort of credit catastrophe, it's more akin to like a 2008. And I'm not, I'm not there at all. But I do think that there is, I think there's a significant risk or a rising risk that the Fed is going to find themselves in a position in late, say, 2023 or early 2024, where the unemployment rate has moved uncomfortably high relative to their target. And they're going to find themselves in a position where uh, they've got to moderate the Fed funds rate back to say, uh, I estimate it's going to be back, we're going to be back to two to 3% um, faster than we're, we're, we're more likely to move back to two and a half or to 3% on the Fed funds, you know, with greater probability than we are to see a surging sort of 1970 style Fed funds rate that moves in the opposite direction. Okay. Jason, how about you? What does your crystal ball say? <laughs> well, let me take a look here. Uh, well, you know, the, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, with December 14th coming up and the, you know, the Fed meeting approaching, uh, and looks like the market's pricing in about a 50 bit rise as opposed to the 75 it's you know been the uh, the most recent movement so you know to to the point uh, that Colin and Kara have mentioned as far as you know potentially um, easing off the uh, uh, that accelerator you know we, we see that you know these macro effects have have micro impacts locally and so as, as real estate developers in DC we're really looking at you know what's the impact on rents uh, for the multifamily portfolios that we're actually in development on right now. And by the way, we think it's a good idea uh, to be delivering product uh, a couple of years from now uh, into a you know, potentially supply uh, constrained market. Uh, it, it's interesting to consider that you know, what we've seen in DC is that you know, historically we've had some resilience where our highs haven't been too high, the lows haven't been too low. And so that whole lag uh, that that Carol was mentioning, we, we've seen that it, it actually took some time uh, for that uh, th- that inflation to show. But you know, September twenty one to twenty twenty two, we saw you know nine percent year over year growth um, here in this particular market, and see that you know NMHC HC uh, National you know Multifamily Housing Council is is showing potentially another year here locally of seven to ten percent growth. So we still have a ways to go. Uh, and uh, so that's where that whole lagging indicator, uh, if there is you know, continued movement, you could see that uh, lagging indicator because necessarily the impacts of Fed action don't show up sometimes for you know, a quarter or two. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's an interesting point about Washington, D.C. being resilient. Um, as far as I know, no one ever gets laid off in Washington, <laughs> D.C., right? Um, well, Assuming then that inflation is going to be persistent, it sounds like no no one on the panel is predicting deflation. And and even if we hit like that three and a half percent number, it's still higher than the Fed's target. So, it you know, I, I think it's a safe assumption, maybe not safe, but it, uh, investors should have that assumption. Investor, uh, you know, inflation may sustain for the indefinite future to just be higher than that long term target. So what are the asset classes? What are the strategies that investors uh, should use that have historically performed well during periods of higher sustained inflation. Jason, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, you know, I, I know everyone's stunned that we would, you know, recommend uh, residential <laughs> multifamily real estate, right? But, but really, when you when you take a look at that asset class, the fact that you do have you know dynamic uh, cash flows in place, meaning that you know you can actually track with inflation, and we can actually see wage growth uh, and We've actually seen some evidence to suggest that, you know, there's been rental recovery as far as incomes um, for for renters. And so, when you actually can reset income, re- reset rents to track the, that income inflation, um, that puts you in a good position. Uh, I'd also say that when you look to markets that that are supply constrained, um, that there's safety there as well. Um, so, you know, in, in in DC we have a multi multitude of factors that, that that drive our economy yes you know the government uh but we also have the private sector which has been you know recently diversifying and so 
you, know, you look to markets where if one particular sector, say the public sector, uh, has to you know, buttress the fact that the private sector is falling behind, um, that gives you, again, a lot of that stability. So you know, looking into rental real estate, into markets um, where there are diversified opportunities for income uh, and supply constraint, uh, in our case, it's because of a height limitation of, of all things. Uh, those are some, some areas that people can look for um, for investment. And, and Kara, how about you? I know in our, our podcast episode, we talked about the rice assets. Um, yeah. Would, would those be your suggestion for inv investors who are concerned about inflation? Definitely. But I think it's also important before we go into the strategies for investing during inflation to talk about what inflation does to your traditional assets. I'll go very quickly. Um, we did do a, a, a deep dive in our, our podcast, so uh, listeners can head over there. But um, but I think the, you know, the if we talk about a 60-40 portfolio, I think the bond side, the fixed income impacts are pretty well understood. Um, you know, your your inflation is eating away at your income um, and bond prices are being pressured by rising interest rates. We've done a lot of data or a lot of research. We have a team of brilliant quantitative strategists here who have done the research and the data has shown us that during periods of high inflation that is rising. So we probably peaked, inflation probably peaked in June, but just a few months ago, we were in this period of high and rising inflation. Your forward 12 month return for equities is negative. So I think it's really important just to set that stage to, you know, to remind people that we are still in this environment that we're probably gonna muddle through this volatility going forward. And inflation is really impacting both sides of your traditional portfolio, and it also impacts the relationship between the two. So during periods of inflation higher than 2%, the correlation between stocks and bonds typically turns positive. And we've, we've experienced that this year um, in, in painstaking fashion. So yeah, I think these, these real asset strategies are going to be just continually important going forward. So yeah, I use the rice mnemonic. I'm a big sushi lover, so that helps me remember it. Um, but it's real estate, infrastructure, commodities, and energy. Uh, Jason, I, I, we are totally uh, in the real estate camp too. So I, I, uh, we're with you there. Um, I think when it comes to real estate, we really like real estate debt right now. Um, I think if we if we think about the fundamentals still look good. Um, I think, you know, if you're thinking about it being more of an income generating market next year, given rising cost of finance, um, I think we really like, you know, getting more defensive, being at the top of the capital structure, benefit from that subordination, because um, equity valuations in real estate still do look pretty high. So um, I think real estate debt is a really exciting area. Um, but more broadly, I think just these real asset portfolios that can go into into those four different asset classes and really be active, really be tactical um, and, and develop more of kind of a full strategy solution is um, how we would recommend it. Absolutely. Interesting points about that 60-40 portfolio. Colin, I'm guessing you might agree with some, if not all of that point about the correlation uh, with the 60-40. So you might have a slightly different philosophy here though, you know, given uh, your ETF and the strategy behind it. Yeah, I mean, our ETF is kind of a, it, to be blunt, it's sort of a boring core holding. We typically in an environment like this, I would advocate for holding sort of an insurance sleeve of a, a portfolio to account for the uncertainty of the next uh, 18 to 24 months. So, you know, like I alluded to earlier, I think we're transitioning into this sort of strange environment where this has been an interest rate risk story and it's evolving more into a credit risk story. And I think the the question that the equity markets are going to have to grapple with in 2023 is, does this turn into a real you know, earnings recession and potentially a real credit event? And in that situation, you know, it's sort of strange because even though we'll have, you know, I'm calling for 3% core PCE by the end of next year, it's the rate of change that matters. And that, that disinflation story is sort of the polar opposite in a lot of ways of what we, we've seen in 2021 and 2020 with the, the rising rate of positive inflation. And so in that sort of a scenario, the, a lot of this from a global macro perspective becomes to a large degree a dollar story. The dollar has rallied because the Fed's been really aggressive on a 
on a, you know, a sort of a, I think a flight to safety basis, the dollar has been the go-to. And as this evolves into more of a credit event, it'll be interesting to see what foreign central banks do, how much, uh, you know, the relative rate of change in, in their policy changes operates versus the Fed. I think foreign central banks are going to be much more aggressive. The Fed is closer to the end of their cycle than they are uh, relative to other foreign central banks. And that means that the dollar story probably starts to flip around, which is, Interesting in the sense that when you look at sort of the, the falling rate of inflation and inflation hedges in general, I think that things like gold, uh, managed futures, and, uh, and weirdly super short duration, things like treasury bills are actually sort of a gift right now. I mean, I, can, I can't remember being able to buy treasury bills at 4.7% for 20 years. Um, so, you know, in a weird sort of way, being able to lock in a 4.7% interest rate relative to what is going to be in, the, in a year from now, I think a, a rate of inflation that's much lower than that, treasury bills, the safest instrument in the economy, actually operate as a pretty good inflation hedge, certainly as a, a, a nominal principal hedge. And so the next 18, 24 months, I think, are going to be fraught with uncertainty. Uh, even though it's going to be a positive rate of inflation, it's going to be a, a falling rate of inflation that is consistent with probably, as Kara alluded to, negative equity prices. Um, if you're looking at this on a, a global basis, the dollar story probably means that foreign equities are more attractive than domestic equities. And so, but even in that situation, I think you still, it still makes a lot of sense to hold an insurance lead for the next 18 to 24 months here. Yeah, I can't argue with holding insurance. Um, and I, I agree, there's just uncertainty. Um, so that being said, and, and Jimmy gave our standard disclaimer at the beginning of the show, which applies to the whole show, and we're not giving personalized investment advice here. But, but that being said, uh, Jason, I'll start with you. How do investors then approach allocating a portion of their portfolio uh, to alts or, or how should they otherwise you know, tweak their portfolio in, in, in a sort of general way? given this uncertainty that we're looking at, given that inflation is high, likely to remain high-ish for the foreseeable future? Sure. Well, well, Andy, I think that that's, it really underscores the importance of this particular forum and, and what you and Jimmy and, and company are, are bringing to bear as far as different concepts and ideas that are timely here in the market. Uh, and, and at the same time, also, you know, bringing to bear those advisors, you know, the, the CPAs, the financial advisors, that uh, can provide this type of, of counsel because um, you know these are historic times that we're, we're, we're coming out of and going into <laughs> uh, even at the same time. Um, and so I, I think it, it takes a team you know, we're, we're very much focused on a team and, and so uh, you know that allocation is, is going to be very personal based on you know risk tolerance, time horizon suitability, all the things that we know make a difference. Um, so, you know, it, it has to be done in consultation, I think, with, with uh, in advisors and investors. But what we find is that there's often a, a sleeve that makes sense for all these different strategies um, based on, you know, one's personal situation. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, that's an answer that won't get you sued. That's for sure. Um, but that's an important point that, you know, tweaking a portfolio is always going to depend on an investor's individual situation their timeline, their goals, and so on. Kara, do, do you have any, you know, rule of thumb? I guess that's really what I'm asking for, if there's any rule of thumb or, you know, tidbit yeah, I, that an investor could take. So I, I don't know about a rule of thumb, but I will use the word, how do investors tweak a portfolio? I might, um, I might actually adjust that language to, I really think investors need to really rethink their portfolios given inflation, all of the uncertainties that we're thinking or that we're, that we're experiencing, excuse me. Um, it's, we really, you know, I think inflation's go, we, we've discussed on this panel, I think inflation's going to remain uncomfortably high. It, yes, it, it should decelerate, but it will remain uncomfortably high. Um, and we talked about just the challenges that traditional assets face. Um, and I think that whether we get inflation back to the 2% target, you know, whenever that happens, I do think that in the, for the longer term, we're, in, we're entering a period, it's called the end of the great moderation, we're big proponents of that, where we're really going to enter a period of higher macroeconomic and then market volatility. So we had, you know, these, this decade of 
falling interest rates, low stagnant growth, little volatility in inflation, in macroeconomic indicators that really translated to really low market volatility. Um, and I think things like deglobalization are going to be big themes going forward. Deglobalization has a direct link to inflation. Um, and so really just we, we're in such a macro driven market right now. And I think that just this map, we're going to be in a period for a number of years of this macro driven market that's going to cause volatility. So I think investors need to, you know, you really need alternatives now and going forward. So Colin, I totally agree with this, you know, the insurance sleeve. And I think, unfortunately, there's so there's. It, it tends to be that we bought the insurance after the accident already happened, right? It's um, and it's not too late. I, th I think we're going to be muddling through this this challenging environment. So whether it's, I know Andy, you're probably looking for me to. I think we talked about a 60-40 becoming like a 50-30-20 or whatever it is. And I don't know if that's again. It's so personal. It's so hard to come up with that rule of thumb. But I do mm -hmm. think that in that alternatives need to be a very core part of investors' portfolios next year and going forward. Absolutely. I appreciate that. And, you know, the deglobalization, I know that FS Investments doesn't have that trademarked or anything, but just because you and Laura mentioned it on our podcast, mm -hmm. that's really stuck with me. Colin, do you have any thoughts on deglobalization? Is that is that going to help set a floor on inflation rates going forward? Um, I mean, honestly, I kind of think the deglobalization narrative is a little bit overblown. I mean, that would imply that like American consumers and American corporations are going to stop outsourcing the production of goods and services to places like China and Vietnam and Malaysia. And to me, Americans like their inexpensive goods and services. They like to be able to buy their cheap trinkets from overseas. And, and that arbitrage, does, especially as I think technology you know, makes the world a smaller and smaller place. I think it just, it actually makes it more and more attractive to, for globalization to actually increase. I, you know, the politics of this all get sort of messy and complex, but I think as a, as a baseline long-term trend, I don't think that the, the shrinkage of the global economy, I don't think is changing. I don't think we're all going back to this world where, you know, we're all like a, a 1940s Japan or something where, you know, we're, we all live on our own island and make our own stuff. That's just, I don't think that American corporations are, uh, they're a little too greedy, I think, to, to probably move in that direction and for the benefit of all of us, frankly. So um, I don't think that deglobalization is likely to be a, a meaningful long-term um, impact on inflation. I think that's more of a sort of a narrative that I think um, was probably sort of a lot politically driven in the last, uh, you know, four years or so. Well, you know, I have a few questions. I want to move into the Q and A because we actually have a couple of questions that relate to that idea of, of deglobalization, and and I think I agree with both of you that it, it can become a, a a narrative, a political narrative that, you know, uh, maybe has been overblown. But you know, at the same time, we've seen a lot of headlines of chip manufacturing and all kinds of manufacturing coming back to the states for various reasons. And we also, you know, coming out of twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, we saw how fragile our supply chain really is, was. And, you know, I, I don't think it's out of the question that we're going to see another shock, geopolitical shock, like we've seen in 2020, like we've seen in 2021. If it's, if it is the end of the great moderation, we may see a shock like that every year for the next 10 years or so. Um, we have a couple questions about labor shortages and how that's driving inflation uh, which, which relates to domestic manufacturing, but also, you know, services and how that all affects the CPI, as well as we had another question about the wage demands of, of unions and just how some small businesses or, or even uh, mid-sized businesses, corporations really feeling that pressure and, and, and that sort of, you know, again, raising the floor of the inflation rate, you know, I'm, I'm not claiming it's going to stay at 8% forever, but, but it may never get back to 2%, right? Um, Jason, what do you think? You know, where, where does labor shortages fit into this conversation? Sure. Well, I mean, it's definitely, definitely a driver. Um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate, you know, here with, with our just experience around, you know, construction. Um, we did experience uh, impacts of, of inflation uh, due to supply chain, uh, not so much with labor. Uh, and that's an area where we actually saw 
definitely greater than seven, eight percent growth. But we saw in some categories over twenty percent uh, inflation. Uh, but it's it's since moderated. Um, but we we've been fortunate where um, we have been able to you know bring our resource to bear at the time that we we've needed it uh, and and haven't had any challenges from a labor perspective. Kara, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree. I think it's just the, it really just adds to that, you know, it's, it's one of the stickiest <laughs> areas of inflation. So I think it just adds to, to those pressures. Um, and, and we're really starting to see that, you know, those, those wages um, contribute me meaningfully to CPI. And Colin, you think that the, the, you know, labor, obviously it's, as Jason and Kara alluded to, it's been this big component. Do you, do you think it could roll over? And, and stop driving it upwards? Or do you think this shortage is just going to continue for the foreseeable future? I do think it's going to moderate. I think a lot of the, the shortage, I mean, there's a messy sort of demographic uh, debate in all of this. The You've got slowing rates of population growth, but you also have a, a shrinkage in the, the size of the workforce, uh, the working age workforce. So um, it's sort of this, you know, tug of war, I think, between those two big trends. And in the long run, globally, I think that the, the falling rate of population growth is the, is the bigger driver, I think, in the long run here. Um, the last few years are really messy in large part because the, you know, the, the federal government was so involved in everything. And, you know, I mean, it was the, it was the perfect recipe for inflation and labor shortages in large part because, the government was paying people not to not to work. So, um, you know, I think we're slowly we're slowly evolving back to this um, sort of pre-COVID type of environment. Are we going to get back to, you know, the world of the 2010s? I don't I don't think we're going to get quite there, but we're starting to see a lot of things sort of just, you know, revert back to where they were pre-COVID, almost like the, you know, the last two years were just sort of a bad dream. And so, I think that, you know, when you start looking at a lot of these things like commodity prices and shipping rates and uh, even rents, you, I think you could even you know, look at, at real estate and say, you know, hey, was the was the 40 to 50 percent bump in in national home prices? Was that sort of just too good to be true? Um, so. So, yeah, long story short, I think a lot of these these more sort of. Um, you know, I think of the the global macro trends and sort of a lot of secular forces where you've got these trends of sort of globalization and technology and demographics. And I think that those those are just a big anchor pulling down inflation. And, you know, the the tricky part is that those are big, slow moving mm -hmm. you know factors in the global macro economy. And it's just not going to happen quickly. But I do think that I think in, you know, by the time we get to like 2025, I think a lot of people are going to look back at the the sort of COVID period and say, man, that was a weird, stupid time for the entire economy and the financial markets. It it sure was. Yeah, I think we can all agree that we've been in for probably a weird couple of years, even a, a weird decade and point taken calling about, you know, birth rate and, and demographics. And, you know, we've seen all, all seen what's happened in Japan where they've been fighting off deflation now for decades, although in the United States, we have a much more um, open and generous immigration policy or effective policy where we still have positive demographic growth, even though we, we don't have uh, a birth rate at the replacement rate. Um, so relating to all this, I had a question for Jason from um, one of our attendees. He says, or she says, I'm curious about Jason's comment about feeling good about delivering new inventory in about two years. Jason, do you see current rates of inflation significantly impacting housing supply over the next couple of years? And, and wouldn't this then further fuel inflation, at least in rents? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and so the, you know, the opportunity to, in, in our particular case, you know, we're delivering product that in our sub market, because of our sustainability initiatives and the rest, there's there's really no competing product that's in our particular market. And so to be able to deliver that, what we consider like a category killing product into a market that's already supply constrained. Um, if you're looking from a real estate investment standpoint at opportunities to be able to you know, outpace inflation, um, those are some market drivers and dynamics that are very positive. Uh, and so that's a key theme uh, 
for uh, our investment strategy. Do you, as a real estate investor, do you worry about demographics at all? Like, you know, with, with the birth rate much so. being so low in the United yeah. States, you know, or do, uh, do you just expect uh, inflation or excuse me, immigration to basically overcome the demographic headwinds? Yes. And, and that's also why we are very particularly focused in a, in a particular market, you know, our, our managing partners, you know, at the for a time had built and developed in some cases outside of market, even globally. But we have very strategically focused all in on DC because of the diversification of that particular market and the resilience mm -hmm. of multiple different points. Um, you know, defense, cyber, and intel as a driver here to help buttress any types of um, uh, softness in other parts of the, uh, the the economy and the labor market, um, and you know, people still coming into this this region. So that very much is a factor for you know where we are very specifically choosing. Uh, to invest because we invest alongside uh, of our of our partners of our LPs, um, you know we're we're very much uh, in alignment. That makes sense. That makes sense. Kara, I have a question specifically for you. Uh, it's about it's my favorite mnemonic, uh, rice. Uh, the it, this attendee asked you to go through that rice acronym one more time for us. Sure. So it's real estate, infrastructure, commodities, and energy. Um, so really just making up what we, what we view as, as a well-constructed or well-rounded real asset portfolio would have elements, um, of all four of those. And I have to plug the podcast episode that we did because it was all about investing in rice in 2023. Yeah. So that's on altsdb.com and, and Kara, <laughs> you have your own podcast. Could, could you give a plug for that as well? Oh, sure. Yeah. I'd be happy to. So, um, I, I do, I host the FS fireside podcast. Um, so Anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, um, and Andy, we'll have to have you on. I'll, I'll, mm. I'll touch base with you after. We'll do a little crossover. Um, but yeah, it's available anywhere you get your podcast. We bring in our chief economist. She's awesome. She was on your podcast, Andy, as well as other experts around our firm. And, and um, we run a sub-advisor model here. So a lot of our great industry partners as well. Awesome. Um, and I'm a listener, by the way. It's a, it's a great podcast. Most investing content, I have to say, everyone, it's pretty boring, right? I mean, I have to I have to listen. I have to read sometimes because it's my job. But honestly, the FS podcast and Colin's site, I, I honestly just read for years just because it was like my morning read. I don't know. It's it's a great read. Um, and, and Colin, at this question, I'm going to direct at you first. Is our unemployment rate underestimating the true rate of unemployment? The questioner asked, as Colin alluded to, the government was paying people to not work for far too long. The labor force participation rate is still at historically low levels. Any long-term concerns there? Um, I'm. It's it's really easy to um, to beat up on the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about the way that they measure all these things. Well, but let's do it. Let's let's beat them up. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I used to do this a lot. I used to beat up on the way these things were measured and stuff. And then I really dug down deep into how they were measured. And just, it, this is really hard stuff to measure. I mean, measuring, getting an accurate read on inflation, for instance, is an impossible task. And that's why there are 20 different measures and a million different components. And, you know, they all weight things a little bit differently. Um, so I don't want to be an apologist for the, the BLS because, um, you know, they're, they're obviously, there's weaknesses in what they do. But at the same time, these are, these are really difficult things to measure. The, the way that they measure the unemployment rate with, you know, people falling out of the workforce, for instance, after they, you know, they stop looking for a job after a little bit, you know, any, I think, common sense person would look at that person and say, that person did not just choose to stop working. They're actually unemployed. Um, you know, things like that, it gets tricky. Um, so are we underestimating the current unemployment rate relative to the size of the workforce? I mean, sure, you could look at things like the U6 rate, which is, you know, people would argue is maybe a little more reflective of, of an accurate unemployment rate. Um, but it, that's why there are you know, it's useful to look at all these different measures because you don't you don't have to only look at the CPI. You don't only have to look at you know PCE for inflation. And that's why the Fed does rely on all these different metrics. They like to strip out certain items because 
you know, oil will go crazy over the course of a month and contribute, you know, a, a sort of misleading read on inflation to some degree. So you've got to look at a broad set of data. I think it, it makes a lot of sense to not just look at the, the headline unemployment rate, but to look at some of these alternative rates. And, you know, there's some phony information out there about a lot of this stuff, sort of conspiracy theory um, narratives, but it's useful to look at a lot of these sort of um, more alternative tor- sort of uh, data points, I think. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, and, and that brings me, I have time for one more question. We're about out of time. Um, but I want to give each of you, each of our panelists, uh, a, a brief, the brief floor here to answer this one. I, I think this is a really good question. Um, and this is more of a macro question versus being specific to inflation. Um, but we have one attendee who asks that there seems to be a disconnect between the level of anxiety over the economy and inflation um, versus some of the other high level economic or macro indicators. Um, for instance, unemployment rate is low. The Dow is still pretty close to an all time high. Yet everyone, uh, the questioner says, everyone is anxious. I, I think that's virtually true. It seems like almost everyone is anxious. So is there a disconnect? Are investors? overly anxious right now? Kara, let's start with you. No, I mean, I think that it's a hard question to answer, right? I mean, I think it's, there's just so much uncertainty. And I think like markets are still just on a daily basis trying to price what's going to happen. You know, we see, we get a strong jobs report and the market sells off. So it's, it's just, there's, I don't know about a disconnect. I think we're just still facing so much uncertainty that we're trying to price this in daily and, and figure out, you know, there's still people out there that say that maybe the Fed's going to engineer a soft landing. Um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, there's whether or not we enter a recession next year or not, growth is slowing significantly. Um, but, you know, we're still just so much uncertainty. You know, I wish I had an accurate crystal ball, um, but I don't know about necessarily a disconnect. Fair enough. Um, Jason, I, I imagine from your standpoint, being in D.C., you might say, what recession? What the heck are you guys talking about? <laughs> Well, you know, that key word that uh, Carol was mentioning, uncertain, is so key uh, as far as the the questioner's uh, query there, because we know that, you know, the market is is uh, psychology, right? And the market can take good news, the market can take bad news, but it's the uncertainty that is brutal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, you know, you're you're sensing right now. Um, And and yes, D.C. can be a bubble. um, And, you know. We're we're, uh, we're not complaining about that fact. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, last word. I think that we're just sort of digesting a lot of the, you know, the way I actually like to think of the last sort of 10 years is this one cycle. I don't think of COVID as its, you know, its own sort of event. I really think of COVID as sort of the, it was the inevitable sort of blow off top of a bull market. And I think that the, a lot of the things that the, the government did and just the unique factors of COVID itself just uh, exacerbated a lot of that. And so we got this big blow off, you know, everybody, you know, stayed at the punch bowl a little longer than they should have went back for more and then, you know, dumped their head into the bowl during COVID. And now we've all sort of woken up and realized, you know, Hey, maybe there are, maybe we drank too much. And so we're just digesting this. And this is part of what makes, I think processes like this somewhat difficult for the markets to digest is that these are, this is not an event that happens quickly. This is digesting this big, you know, the big excesses of the last few years, especially takes time. And especially when the central component of this is real estate driven, which I think a lot of this is a lot of this, the current slowdown is revolving around uh, residential real estate. That is just an inherently very slow moving sector of the economy. And so this whole process is just, it's going to take longer than is comfortable. And so in a way, you know, to use an analogy, it's this is sort of, I think, reminiscent of like the 2001 recession to some degree, where it's just sort of this rolling, slow moving beast that is just a digestion of a big blow off that occurred previously. And in the long run, it'll all take care of itself. We'll all look back and, you know, the I have no doubt that the S&P 500 will be much, much higher in 10 or 15 years than it is today. But I think that the next you know, sort of two to three years are fraught with uncertainty as we just sort of digest this, um, you know, the big excesses of the last few years. I think that's a good way to put it, Colin. Um, Stupendous insights here from our panelists. Uh, We've run out of time officially. 
We have our next uh, fun presentation is up here in a minute. So I'm going to cut all of you loose. Thanks again to Jason Cross from Red Brick LMD, Kara O'Halloran from FS Investments, Colin Roche from Discipline Funds. Uh, very good insights today. And, and Jimmy, I'm going to turn it back to you.